You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Well, as you heard, uh, we've come in from California, but this ain't a California accent, everybody. This is the voice of God. This is an Irish accent. And when you get to heaven, you're going to talk like this, okay? This is, we will all be the same in heaven. We'll all be Irish. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, Yeah, I think it'll be okay. Yeah. It'll be very loud, okay, but it'll be fun. So, so good to see you. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm married to the sweet Isabel. Uh, we've been married for 30 years, everybody. 30 years this year. Uh, I told her, you deserve a medal. And she said, a ring will do. Yeah, a ring will do. Isabel is French. Ooh, la, 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 la. And that is working. We've got four kids. Four no more. Four no more. We did our bit for church growth, Okay. Some of you come, young couples get home and get busy. Come on, we've got to grow a church. But we've got four kids, and Ben is 27, and he's married to Kalina. Uh, a wonder. He, he moved to America, and he got himself an American girl, and she is just amazing. Then we've got Dan. He lives in New York. Uh, ben lives in Sacramento with Kalina. And then Abigail lives in London, okay, down in London. She's studying at King's College, London. And then Nathan is back home, and he's like a missionary to America, a missionary to America, because he wants to tell them, it ain't soccer, it's football, everybody. Are you with me? It is football. It's round and it's beautiful and that's what it should be. Uh, and it's just great to be here today. And again, I want to give a big shout out. Can we put our hands and welcome everybody joining online? It is so good to see you guys and girls. Thank you. And Geneva, bonjour mes amis. Je t'aime en Suisse. Anyway, uh, something like that. I love you. Okay. But anyway, it's good. It's good to be here. Uh, do you know what I am? I'm a big fan of the Word of God. How many people love the Word of God, okay? And today I want to talk about this really simple, okay? I want to talk about this, what it is to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. That's my simple life goal, everyone. It used to be I wanted to play for Man United, but they're awful. And so I've given up on that, all right? I've given up on that. I just want to focus on higher things, okay? A revival is coming, come on! No, I don't know. Anyway, listen, seriously, all I want to do is I want to be like Jesus. Here's the reality. If I am more like Jesus, my wife is going to have a better life. Is that true? My kids are going to have a better life. My neighbors are going to have a better life. The way I drive is going to be different if I'm more like Jesus instead of a demon. Yes, are you with me, everyone? I'm going to be like, here's the truth, everyone. Our communities are going to be better, and England is going to be better. United Kingdom is going to be, Europe is going to be better when the church starts being like Jesus. And I'm going to be uh, reading from a passage from Luke chapter 4. And if you're here and you're brand new and you're not into the whole church thing, and actually you got up this morning and you were like just wanting to go to Tesco, but you took the wrong turn and you got into this box and you're just wondering what the karaoke is without the bouncing ball. What are these people doing? We are here to tell you that we are all about Jesus. And there was a guy that wrote about Jesus. His name was Luke. He was a medical doctor. And he wrote to his friend who wasn't probably from like a Christian background. And he was just trying to explain to him who Jesus was. And we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 4. And this is when Jesus, he's been born and he's grown up. He's been baptized. He was tempted by the devil. There was a spiritual battle. And he starts to come home. And this is what it says here in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. Just stop there for a moment, everybody. This is the dream of audacious church that the news of Jesus would spread through the whole countryside. Yes, that's, that's our dream, everyone. The people, boys and girls and men and women, that we would be the prophets, that we would be the evangelists, just spreading the news, gossiping the gospel. Yes, everyone. And retweeting it and just sharing the good news of Jesus Christ through the whole countryside. And I love this here. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised Glenn. No. 
Everyone praised Paul. No, everyone praised Andy. No, no, listen to me. Everyone praised Jesus. Come on, we got to keep focused, everyone. It's about Jesus Christ and no one else. And that celebrity stuff, it doesn't work. Look at me, everyone. I'm the same as you. I'm just a big mess without Jesus. Are you with me? I'm just a big mess without Jesus Christ. We're humble servants and not what God has called us to be. So how, how can I be like Jesus? Well, here's the first thing, everyone. To be like Jesus, I, I just need to be full of the Spirit. He's our model, everyone. How did Jesus live that life? Well, he was just full of the Spirit. So I have the privilege of doing this, getting to travel around a little bit like Glenn. Uh, a lot of it happens in the United States and invariably it involves a flight. And when I land, I've got to get a rental car. Um, because I'm a pastor, this is normally what I get, okay? It's called a Chevy Malibu, a Chevy Malibu. And it's not the car of your dreams. No one has ever woken up in the morning and said these words, I would love a Chevy Malibu. No way, everyone. It's a horrible car. And it's basically like a hairdryer with four wheels. That's all it is, okay? And it ain't much, okay? But it suits a pastor's budget. That's what we're talking about, okay? And uh, one time I took my two oldest boys with me uh, to preach. And I went down to get my Chevy Malibu. And they looked at it and they were like, Dad, that is shameful. That is shameful. And the girl that was helping us, she said, well, you don't need to take it because today we've got a special offer and for an extra $20 a day, you can get one of these, okay? It's a Dodge Challenger, everyone. It's got a 5.7 liter engine in it. Oh my goodness. They call it a widow maker, this thing, okay? It is just incredible. Why do I tell you this, everyone? Because... Listen to this here. Life without the Holy Spirit is like driving a Chevy Malibu. Life with the Holy Spirit is a Dodge Challenger, everyone. It's a serious upgrade. We got some power in the engine. We can do some damage. Are you with me, everybody? I'm serious. It's so, so important. By the time I finish this sermon, people at the back will even be standing, okay? Just need a little more engine in them, okay? But seriously, everyone, the Holy Spirit is so, so important. Let me explain to you biblically. It's not just an audacious thing, okay? It's a biblical thing, okay? 68 chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, 34 references to the Holy Spirit. You just read actually Luke's Gospel, read about the birth of Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, the whole way through it. First two chapters, are re re uh, read it. Then there's 28 chapters that John wrote between his Gospel and the Epistles, 21 references to the Holy Spirit. And then in Luke's like second season, Netflix, okay? The the second season, it's called the book of Acts, there's 56 references to the Holy Spirit. This is how important the Holy Spirit is, okay? We love the Bible at this church. I'm going to show you it from the New Testament, okay? We are born of the Spirit, John chapter 3, sealed by the Spirit, Ephesians 1. We bear fruit by the Spirit, Galatians 5. We walk in the Spirit, Romans 8, pray in the Spirit, Ephesians 6. And also from that chapter, we carry the sword of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, we got the gifts of the Spirit, which are still alive. We preach in the power of the Spirit, Acts 2. And then we are led by the Spirit, Romans 8. Comforted by the Spirit, John 16. And we know the fellowship of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 13. I don't care if you're Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, or a Baptocostal. I don't care what you are. Listen to me. If you believe in the Bible, you believe in the Holy Spirit. You believe in the Holy Spirit. You, you and I, we cannot do life. We were always taught this. Glenn and I, we were always taught this. Don't preach to people Sundays. Preach to their Mondays. And listen to me. The Holy Spirit is not just a person for our Sundays to help us get our hands in the air and get our prayers going on. It's actually to get us out of bed on a Monday morning and go to work and go to school and go to our neighborhoods and make a difference. My goodness. Someone in the middle even stood up. It's working its way backwards, everybody. It's, it's happening. But for some people that are here and you're feeling suspicious today because you hear me even say the words of the Holy Spirit. But yeah, yeah. Some of us, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Word. But we don't believe in God the Holy Spirit. We know he's there, but, but because of our church experience, we get a bit freaked out because you went to some church that was full of wackos and full of weirdos and they were all taking the Kool-Aid and it was all like a little bit strange and you were going like, you know what, I, I've come along this church today, you got some Irish guy in, this is really weird. Listen to me. 
This is really important, everyone. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. He makes me me. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. He makes me me. If you're weird, that's on you. Don't blame God. Don't blame God. God's going, I ain't nothing to do with me. That's whatever that's on then. Stop being weird. Yes, come on. The world does not need weird Christians. It needs Christians that are naturally supernatural. The reason I was given a body, everyone, was to carry the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? That's why I was given a body, was to carry the Holy Spirit inside of me. God has called me to be his zip code, and call it in America, his postcode over here. His postcode. When people go, where's God? Show me where God is. Hello. <laughs> Let me explain it this way. Can I give you a brief history of God? Brief history of here, here it is. So what you had at the beginning, okay, in eternity, before time, time is a created thing. Do you know that God is amazing? God created time. He's the Alpha and the Omega. God is so cool, everyone, he finished before he started. Have you ever thought about that? He actually finished before he started. He's the Alpha and Omega all at one. Boom, okay? But outside of time, the thing that he created, there's a thing called eternity. And in eternity, God dwelt in perfect unity with himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Like the original boy band, they were never going to have a split. They were never going to separate. Perfect unity. They enjoyed that unity and community so much, they thought, let's have a creation that can enjoy this and live in community. Listen to me. Isolation is from the enemy. Community is from God. That's why the church exists, everybody. And so what did God do? God created, okay, a garden called Eden. And if you, just, if you delve into the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, you will find that the word Eden means Disney, everybody. That's what it means, Disney. It was God's original theme park. All the rides were free. There was no lines. There was nothing like that. And Adam and Eve were in it, and they were just naked. Yeah, that's what made it real fun, everybody. Just like, like mom and dad in the park, chasing each other all day. You're it, yeah. I mean, how cool would that be, okay? Well, I, I would like it. And uh, if it were just Isabel and I, obviously. Yeah, okay, just to put that caveat in, that's really important to Isabel and I, who we've been married for 30 years. Okay. But what did we do, everyone? What, what did we do? We trashed God's theme park through our own sin and selfishness. 102 different nations in this church. Can we give it up for God, everybody? <laughs> different ethnicities, different backgrounds, but listen, we're all a mess. We're all a disaster. We're all sinners. And we wrecked God's theme park. God said, get out of my theme park. I want you out of my theme park ruining everything. And I want you to get some clothes on. Get down to TK Maxx and get some clothes. Do you know what hell is going to be? It's going to be TK Maxx just looking through all of those railings forever and ever and ever. And all the clothes are too tight. Don't go to hell, people. Come to Jesus today, okay? And so, but God said, no, no, I still, love, I still love my creation. And he went to a guy called Abraham. And he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. It's really important, singular seed. It's the promise of Jesus. I'm going to bless your seed. But in the meantime, some of your descendants are going to have to go down to a place called Egypt. It's going to be really, really difficult down there for 400 years, but I'm going to send a deliverer. And that was a guy called Moses. Quick history of God, everyone. That's a guy called Moses. He tried to do it by himself. You can't help God. God don't need help, everybody. All right, he tried to help God and God said, no, go out to the desert. He's 80 years old. He's sitting around doing nothing. That's what you do at 80. It's okay, everybody. And he's sitting at 80 years old and then God, what does he do? God says, I'm going to get into a bush. That's so weird. God gets into a bush. Have you ever tried to get into a wetsuit, everyone? It's like the hardest thing in the world. You're trying to squeeze yourself in and whatever. How did God fit into a bush? I don't know. He got into the bush. What happened? The bush went on fire. Look at me for a moment. When God gets in your life, you will go on fire. It's what happens. It's just what happens, people. It's just what happens. And so the bush speaks to Moses. Moses answers. How do you explain that to your wife? You go home. I had a great conversation with the bush today. <laughs> Honey, you need to sit down and get a cup of tea. 
But it was God and God said, hey, I'm gonna get out of the bush and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get in a cloud, the original iCloud, that was, wasn't Steve Jobs, it was God, everybody, okay? I'm gonna get into a cloud and then the cloud's gonna get into a box, yeah, yeah, Indiana Jones, readers, yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna get in a box and then I'm gonna get in a temple and what did we do, everyone? We trashed God's temple. Sin and selfishness again. And then God turns around, quick history of God. He said, no more bushes, no more clouds, no more boxes, no more temples, I'm going to get in a body myself. This is Christmas, everybody. Can I just throw this in by a way, by the way, everyone? You just heard your Christmas services being announced. Can I ask you to go crazy with invitation? Because this is the one time in the year, we call them in America, we call them CEOs. There's people out there, they're CEOs. Christmas, Easter, and other. That's when they come to church. The prime might not come all year. But they'll come at Christmas, they'll come at Easter, and guess what? They'll come for a funeral or a wedding. This is the time to go crazy, everybody. I'm serious. Why? Because you're going to have a you're going to have a train here. A freaking train is going to be in this church. It's going to be incredible. I'm serious. Invite, invite, invite. That's just a by the way. Okay. Christmas is so important. God in a bod. Jesus came to earth. And he said, I'm going to be with them. I'm going to sit on a throne and shout at them. I'm going to come into the neighborhood. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be right there. And he lived a perfect life. He died the ultimate death, everybody. He defeated the grave. And he came out of it with resurrection power. Come on. Incredible. But this is the really good news. This is the really good news for us. He turned around and he said this here. He said, I'm going to leave you, but that's really good for you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to come and He is going to fill your life. And this is the radical thing about the New Testament, okay? We no longer go to the temple. Do you realize that the Romans used to get freaked out by the Christians and they thought they were atheists. Why? Because they didn't have a temple. And the Romans used to say to them, show us your temple. And they used to go, whoa, you're looking at it. We are nigh the temple of the Holy Spirit, everybody. We carry God around with us. We carry God. We don't go to church. We are the church, everybody. We bring it everywhere. Do you know what people say? People ask me, oh, what's the difference about Christianity? And what makes Christians different? And sometimes we say, you know, this is their mindset. You know, well, Christians don't do drugs most of the time. And, uh, and they don't get drunk most of the time. And they're not pimps. They're not dealers. And they cut their, their grass like to a really appropriate level and put a Wembley stripe on it. Listen, that doesn't make you a Christian. That makes you middle class. And Jesus did not die to make you middle class. You can be middle class and be lost. Jesus died that you might be filled with the Spirit of God and carry His presence into every single strata of society, people. What does that look like? Okay, what does that look like? Well, it can be as dramatic as this. So 30 years ago, I graduated from college with Stuart and Julie and all of that. And and, and then I went to Scotland with Isabel and I, I went to be, I had still to be trained as a minister. So once a month, we had these ministers training days. It was in Govan in Glasgow. And there used to be a gentleman there, um, a guy called Ron Hayton, who was 80 years old. And he used to pay for our lunch. And we loved him because he fed us. We, he was just an amazing man. And Ron, while he lived in Scotland and pastored there, still at 80 years old, he was an Englishman and had been in the British military. He was a sergeant major. And he was still at 80 years old. He was straight as a die. Straight as a die, everyone. Just straight as a die. And uh, I remember saying, Ron, you're so healthy. You're, you just look amazing. What's the secret, Ron? And he said to me, well, you know, I take vitamins every day. and I, do, I try to walk to as many appointments. I also try to get there early to never get stressed. That's a good little point. But he said, yeah, but then there's something that happened in my childhood. When he was 12 years old, he was from Manchester, everybody, and he got TB, he got tuberculosis. And back then, there wasn't really a treatment for it. They didn't know what to do with him. And the best thing that he could do was stick him out on the balcony of Manchester Royal Infirmary outside. And there was a pastor from this city, man of God. His name was John Nelson Power. John went up to the hospital. 
He walked out on the balcony and most people were trying to keep away from people with TB. He walked up and he said, Ron, son, you've been here far too long. He brought out a bottle of anointing oil, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. He anointed him with oil and he said, Ron, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And he was immediately healed. This is what Ron said. Ron said, Andrew, I've never been back to hospital in my life. He became a Christian, became the drummer in the church. They got him a cage. <laughs> Thank God for drummers. He became the drummer. And this is what he said. I can still remember as a teenage boy watching the healing services in the church. And people would come with cancers and we would pray for them. And they would have to run out to the toilet to pass out the tumors to get rid of them out of their bodies. He said there were so many healings that happened in the life of the church. I just want to say audacious. I just want to say Manchester. The Holy Spirit is still alive today. He is still full of power. Yes. And God wants to heal and do stuff. And, and listen to me. Last night. Last night, Isabel and I, we went out walking in Manchester. We went out walking in Manchester and, and it was later at night. And let's just say it was a little crazy out there. It was a little crazy out there. It was like three girls to one dress. Like it was just, <laughs> wow. And, uh, and, and it was cool too. It was like weird. And, and so, but I'm, I'm, and do you know what? Just, just hear me for a second. There is no way that that generation it's going to rise to something that's just like, oh, leave that and become middle class. They're never going to do that. They need to know that God is alive, that the church is alive, that there is something here that God exists, that we show them who God is, everybody. Are you with me? But it doesn't always have to be as dramatic as that, okay? Uh, my, my wife, um, we've got um, our daughter and daughter-in-law and they went up to a, uh, like this outdoor shopping mall in, in Southern California. It's kind of expensive, the more go there to browse. It's like when you walk in, your visa already starts paying just by breathing, you know? And, and they went there for lunch and then we're going to start the trip there. And they had lunch and they clean them, a daughter-in-law and Abigail were like, yeah, let's go to the stores. And Isabel said, you just go on. Do you know why? She said, she just felt the ping of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that God talks everyone? He does talk. God texts you and he pings you. And there's the ping of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the young girl that had been like serving their table came over and Isabel just felt to talk to her and just said, thank you so much for serving us. You have been amazing. And this was all legit. And your personality, you're so vibrant. This is what she said. We've just started a new church in this area. You would fit right into our church. And then Isabel brings out a little card. It's called, we have them in our church, your invited card. And we have written on it, a church, a church for people that don't like church. <laughs> And we give this to her and she immediately teared up, started to cry. And Isabel said, no, no, I don't mean to put pressure on. She said, no. She said, I've just moved into this area. I don't know anyone. And when I was driving to work this morning, she said, I thought I need to get a church. And I said, God, would you help me? And God, would you get me a church? And look what you did today. The Holy Spirit, everyone. Be full of the Spirit. It makes life an adventure. And the next one is this. If you want to be like Jesus, be full of the Word. Be full of the Word. He went to Nazareth. That's Jesus he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Can I just stop there for a moment? The hardest place to be a missionary is in your own street. So many Christians, they'll raise thousands of pounds, take a flight, fly across the world to the Philippines or wherever. They'll fly across the world, but they won't cross the street. Jesus came home and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his what? Custom. Look at this. As was his custom. Don't make your church attendance just an erratic thing. Make it a custom thing. 
And I want to say this here to all the parents in the room. Parents, you are so disciplined with your children. Like you're so ultra organized with them, you know. And you make sure that they go to school every single day. Even when they're faking it. Even when it looks like they've got a cold. You're like, get out the door. You are going to school. And on Monday night, you bring them to football. On Tuesday night, you bring them to rugby. On Wednesday night, they're playing chess. On Thursday night, they're swimming and whatever. And yet it comes to Sunday and you go, ah, oh, well, maybe miss church. You see, it used to be that we worshiped God and played sports, but what's happened sometimes is we play God and worship sports. And as much as your child or Manchester United needs your child, listen to me, the most important thing that your child needs in their life is a regular church attendance. I'm serious, everybody. And you model something, parents. You model something. You model something. Jesus said, as was his custom. I love this. He stood up to read the scroll. And just for context here, people didn't have their own individual Bibles. They just had like big scrolls down at the synagogue. Now, some people at school had learned this off by heart, but not everyone knew it. So they came to synagogue to hear the word of God. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And we'll look at that in a moment. Jesus was perfectly balanced. So don't say to me here today, well, you know what? I love what you just said there, Andrew. Holy Spirit, I'm a Holy Spirit person. Holy Spirit, I'm not really a Bible person. That's nonsense. That's nonsense, everybody. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. And the Holy Spirit will guide you to the book he wrote, everybody. So you can't have the Spirit without the Word. And Glenn and I, we were taught this when we were growing up. Okay, If all you have is the Spirit, you'll blow up. If all you have is the Word, you'll dry up. But if you have both, you'll grow up. It takes a perfect balance of both of them. The Holy Spirit's always leading me to truth. Where is the truth? You, the nonsense that you find in the self-help section of the bookstore, you, you'll find the truth inside of yourself. It's a load of nonsense, everyone. You will never find, you will find sin and selfishness at the heart of yourself. Yeah, just channel your inner you. That's nonsense. What if you're a serial killer? Be yourself. There's murderers out there. Don't be yourself. Stay away from me. It's nonsense, everyone. Find the truth in the Word of God. And here's the truth. Churches today are compromising. I don't want to sound like some stupid, you've been in America so long as a fundamental. No, listen to me. This is basically it, everyone. It's the Word of God and we can't get away from it. We just can't get away from the Word of God. It's just too important, everybody. It's just too important. <laughs> Isn't it great when the keys come out? It's like, it's just going to finish soon. It's, just gonna... <laughs> it's like hope comes into the building. It's like, God, we're going to see the game. We're going to see the game. We're going to see it. I have a few more things to say, so don't get your hopes built up too soon, okay? Is that all right? So a bit of Bohemian Rhapsody for a moment, whatever, because this is going to get exciting. Let me, I've got a few other things to tell you this here. Why is this so important that we build our lives on the Word? Let me explain a little bit about my life. So when I was born, I was born into conflict. Northern Ireland, Belfast, all of that stuff. My father was a serving police officer. Uh, he'd been a Royal Marine for nine years. A naval missionary led him to Christ in Portsmouth, England, everyone. A man by the name of Ted Seymour. Shared the gospel with him and changed generations, everybody. An incredible man, my dad. He came back to Northern Ireland, thought he would have a quiet life. Leave the Marines, have a quiet life, join the police. <laughs> and for those that are older in this room, you would remember even what your own city went through with terrorist attacks. And when we were growing up, there was no such thing as just getting up in the morning and going out to school. That never happened. Dad just didn't give you a ride or a lift in the car. What happened was dad would go out first. We would stay in the house. He would go around on his knees, look underneath the car to see if there was a tilt switch. Then we'd drive the car around the block and only then could we get in the car. 
because police officers were seen as a legitimate target by terrorists. 1976, last century, everybody. It was the last day of the year. There was a little hope in the air that maybe there could be a peace process. Sadly, it took another 20 years. And that day, there was a knock at our front door. That was always a horrible moment in our lives when there was a knock at the front door, especially in the evening because the curtains were always pulled. And the thought was that basically, if someone answered, or sorry, knocked on the front door, my dad would never just stand behind the door and answer. He would stand, say the front door was there. He would stand in the living room door, hold his gun to the side and would come out with these words, who's there? He would stand at the side in case someone shot through the front door. As a child, my bedroom door, front door was here, go up the hallway, my bedroom door was here. And then if you opened the bedroom door, there was the head of my bed. And my dad would say those words, who's there? I would sit up immediately just in case someone shot through the door. The bullet went up the hallway, went through the door and would hit me in the head. That night, a neighbor said, Derek, it's me. He opened the front door and he said, yes. And he said, Derek, I think, and boom, our street blew up. I think we got a picture of the carnage that was left on the street. There was a family, this is the street where I lived in. Our, our house was just up there. And a family, two down the street, had got a very inadequate warning. They picked up their little 18 month old boy and Graham was blown to death by the bomb. He was killed by the bomb. My father, obviously being a police officer, was one of the first ones on the scene. Later that year, it's a longer story, my father in the line of duty was shot and almost killed. His friendly fire actually, he was dressed as a young detective chasing terrorists, called for backup, and a young soldier, because the soldiers uh, were there trying to help the police, thought he was a terrorist, saw him with a gun and thought he was a terrorist, and shot him with the most powerful rifle in the world, hit him here in his body, went straight through his body, almost severed his right arm from his body and left a hole the size of two fists in his body. Somehow he lived. Why did I tell you that story? Because it wasn't only the physical pain my father felt, the emotional pain. This is what he said. He said, Andrew, I had colleagues that died in my arms, too many of them. And I had terrorists that died in my arms. But I spoke Jesus over both of them. I spoke Jesus over both of them. On Wednesday, Isabel and I, we fly to celebrate my dad's 80th birthday. And we're not going to celebrate a, a cantankerous, toxic, bitter old man who talks about the war. We're going to celebrate a vibrant, joy-filled, grace-filled, tender-hearted, And how has he kept his heart that way? Jesus said this, that if you make the choice, when you hear my words, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you hear my words and build your life on them, it's like building your life on a rock. And he said this, when the storms come, not if, when the storms come, and you're either like coming out of a storm, going through a storm, or about to go into a storm. Come on, everybody. When the storms come, your house will what? It will stand. Reading the Bible is not just a little religious thing. It's life, everybody. It's foundational. It's food. It'll change everything. You need the Word of God in your life. I gotta land this. Gotta land this. Why do I need to be full of the Spirit? Why do I need to be full of the Word? Well, I want to be like Jesus so that I can join Him in mission, everyone. I want to join Jesus in mission. Jesus read these words. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Isn't that beautiful, everyone? Because He has anointed me to worship. He has anointed me to feel good in devotions. No, He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, to get out there and do it. Yes, are you with me? That's what he wants us to do. So uh, I live in the United States of America uh, and I love the country. And I've tried to understand their football. I've tried to understand NFL, their football. And I can't, it's witchcraft, everyone. I just can't understand. It's just witchcraft. I just, I just, you know, when you're not raised in it, you do your best. And I just can't get it, you know. And there's two teams, but actually there's four teams. There's offense, defense, and it's just nonsense. And that's all it is. Okay, it's, that's, that's really what it is. If you bring it down, and I, I love my, if you're American here today, we can pray for you at the end of the service. And, uh, and so, but, but listen to me, there is like, there's one thing that I want to do in the NFL. And I want, I want to be part of the huddle. I don't know if you, I, mean, I think we've got a picture there. There's a huddle. That's, that's like when the players all get together. And I, this is what I want to do, everyone. I want to put on the pads. I want to put on the pants. I want to put on the shoulders. I want to put on the helmet. I just want to walk into a huddle because it feels very manly. I just want to do huddly things, you know, like, ha, ha, yeah, you know, I just, I just want to do, ah, 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 boom, yeah, yeah. I just want to do that, but not get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get anywhere. I don't want anyone running at me. I don't want anyone charging me down. I don't want to do anything like that. I just don't want to do that. I just want to do, ah, boom. That's all I want to do. But people, they don't pay money to watch the huddle. They pay money to watch the game, everybody. Yes, that's what they pay money to do. Listen to me. See this here right now? This is the huddle. That's all this is, everyone. It's just the huddle. Worship leader comes out and goes, come on, everybody, get on your feet. And this, this audacious worship, come on, everyone. We got to do this. And we go, ah, yeah. Pastor Glenn comes out and he does all this huddly stuff. Yeah, boom, boom. And he's like getting you all fired up. Yeah, ah. Yes. And we have a great huddle on a Sunday. Yeah. But the game is out there, everybody. The game is out there. That's where the game is. It's not the game. It's with your neighbors who are hurting, your neighbors who are crying. It's your neighbors who need Jesus. Are you with me, everyone? And you're starring in the game. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com.